Okay, so uh, class should be unlocked on Blackboard, right? All right, so if you go on here, so let's, uh, under content, should be the syllabus. There's the syllabus guy here. We'll zip through this thing real quick. The who? Well, that's the last time it was, like, updated. Yeah. Um, although I did make a small change yesterday, so technically I should have updated that, but whatever. Uh, all right, so this is computer infrastructure, computer organization, computer architecture. You know, we'll, we'll talk about kind of what some of those different things mean um, today. Oh, actually, this is an uh, this is old. This is actually completely inaccurate. There should be six credits hours, six credit hours here. Um, so I don't know. I'll update some of that, but the other stuff is important. Uh, the other stuff's correct. All right, so we do have a textbook for uh, this class. Uh, it's an online textbook from a place called Zybooks. So if you go to zybooks.com, there's a code you put in, this guy right here, and then you subscribe. Um, I don't know, it's probably 65 or 70 bucks or something like that, but it's a completely interactive textbook. Uh, we'll be referencing it some today, but it'll look like this once you're here. Actually, when you first go into uh, the class, you'll see 548 computing infrastructure. And then in here, you have all these different chapters and stuff, but it's um, interactive. So there's like things that you can drag around and they give you, you know, it's good. It's a good book. So we've been using, uh, I've used this several times before. Uh, it's, it's only online. Yeah, it, there's no physical copy of the book. Yeah, the book, is, you'll have it instantaneously. There's no shipping or anything. It's, it's access to their website, uh, which is, and, and the book is a subscription to the book. So the book will be gone um, probably sometime in June or something like that. You won't have access to it anymore. But there's lots of exercises and things like that that you'll do in the book. It's like part of your homework and things like that. Yeah, so it's not just your trip, typical read the book, boring stuff. It's it's something that's actually beneficial. Yeah, not starting off strong there, Edwin. But you can, you can sign up for that in a little bit. Let's pay, pay, pay attention to the rest of this. Okay, so in any case, so get the book. Um, grade breakdown. So you'll have 60% of your grade is going to be homework. I will give pop quizzes. They'll count as homework assignments. So if uh, it seems like people aren't paying attention or uh, you know not... not uh, uh, having an interaction in class and that kind of stuff, or if a bunch of people show up late, you know, uh, then then maybe, maybe they'll be, you know, well, sometimes a lot of people missing, a lot of people being late, that's a free quiz, but usually it's, uh, I'll do a quiz, but the good news is, is when you take a quiz, even if you just put your name on it, you get at least a 30%. Okay, so that's going to be better than the people who missed. Right, but the quizzes will count as part of your uh, homework grade, so... Uh, every and I kind of changed that this year because historically, depending on the class, you may have more or less quizzes. So sometimes you miss one or two quizzes. And now you have a 30 30 percent quiz average, and it was worth 10 percent of your grade or something. So I just wrapped it into homework. Uh, so you'll have lots of homework assignments. There'll be a midterm and a final, each worth 20 percent of your grade. I have my usual policy where if you do better on the final exam than you did on the midterm, I'll replace your score in the midterm exam with whatever you got in the final. All right, so if you screw up the midterm, you can do better in the final and then uh, fix a bad whatever. And then it's the standard 90, 80, 70 grading scale. I think a 93 and above is an A, you know, 92, 91, 90 is a A minus, blah, blah, blah. All right, questions about grading and that jazz. Decent sense? Okay, uh, as usual, um, I record all my lectures, so you notice I already have this uh, thing being screen captured up here. So on uh, Blackboard, you'll see that there's a link already for streaming lectures. This will take you to YouTube, where the playlist for this class is. So if you ever need to go to have you put to sleep some night, just go rewatch the lectures or whatever. Uh, you might find it beneficial if you've never done uh, uh, Android programming before or Java programming to go back and look at some of that the stuff that we do um, today related to that. Um, you know, all of you should have had some programming uh, in, from various classes in the past. Uh, so if you, even if you haven't done that specifically, picking up the, the tools to do that isn't a huge, huge deal. 
Uh, also, the slides, I uh, make them available. So we'll be, this is from a different class. The slides for this class are already up and I share them through iCloud. So uh, you can click the link and you can always get the most up-to-date version of the slides. All right, so um, uh, feel free to take notes during class, but you'll always have exactly what I'm doing uh, uh, on the screen. So you know, I encourage you not to sit there and try to jot down every little thing I say, maybe be more interactive and we'll have some back and forth banter and help us get us through four hours, right? Something like that. Okie dokie. So that's the book. That's the slides. That's the lectures. Any questions, comments, concerns, bribes? All right. Well, then let's kind of dive in. Um, now, just kind of from the topic of the class, when we hear something like computer infrastructure, computer architecture, um, uh, computer organization, those phrases, what does that mean to you? Like when you saw the name of this class, what did you think this class was going to be about? Tell me what your perception is. Study about hardware. Study about hardware. Okay. Now, when you say hardware, what do you what do you mean specifically about hardware? Okay, look kind of within the hardware, like how, well, you know, we kind of have this vague idea what a computer is, but maybe kind of what stuff is in there and how those things kind of talk to other things, that kind of stuff. All right. Anything else? Say who? Um, yeah, so I mean, we actually are going to talk about that a little bit today, but that's more of a networking type thing, but the, the concept of of uh, what a um, kind of a, a, a server farm might look like because we more of an infrastructure uh, type thing. Um, okay, so what's a computer? As you've seen in my, some of my other classes, I try to dumb down things that uh, sometimes have really vague answers, right? You know, and also in technology, we usually have some really fancy names for things that actually mean easy, easy things as well. So when you think about a computer, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Like a laptop or desktop computer? That, that's what we've traditionally thought of as being a computer. But are there are other things technically computers? So what, what would be a kind of a generic definition of a computer? Well, you solve problems. Are you a computer? So you mentioned something that solves problems, and I said, are, you know, human solves problems. So are you, would you say you're a computer? No. Well, so if I give him a quiz and he solves the problem, he's been instructed to solve a problem and he does it. Okay, so he has free will to ignore me. <laughs> okay, so kind of at the end of the day, a, a computer kind of has a, a, a meaning with how it's kind of organized under the hood, right? It, it's definitely a machine, right? Okay, so you, when we start getting into living things, those those they might be capable of computation, you know, a person, but a computer kind of implies a, kind of a minimum set of stuff that it has. And we'll talk about kind of what those things are. But, you know, when we think about computers, what things are computers? So obviously laptops slash desktops. What else is a computer? Who? Mobile. Mobiles are our phones. So smartphones, really any kind of phone, but yeah, smartphones, definitely computers, right? In fact, actually, if we go back to older cell phones, that, that probably is the part where it maybe makes more sense because those are technically computers, even though, you know, these guys now really start, they start feeling like computers, right? 
we're not surprised that this is a computer because we kind of use it to replace a lot of the stuff we used to do on our laptops. But when you have one of these old Motorola flip phones or something like that, if somebody told you that was a computer, that might not necessarily just immediately ring true. But it is. It's a computer. It, it, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a general purpose computer. You know, it's built to solve a very specific problem, but it is a computer. What else? Okay, we've got calculators. So certainly graphing calculators be kind of like our smartphone version of it, where just a normal plain Jane uh, uh, calculator would technically still be a general purpose -y, or uh, I'm sorry, a very domain specific type of uh, computer. What about some of our household appliances now? We have smart fridges and, and uh, toasters and stuff like that. How many of you have ever seen something called uh, uh, IoT? What does IoT stand for? Internet of Things. Right, so this is kind of uh, um, a, a newer, yeah, probably over the last, I don't know, three or four years, kind of maybe it's just become kind of a hot topic where uh, we just decided that everything needs to be on the internet. Our toaster needs to be connected to the internet and our fridge and our shoes and, you know, every, before long everything's on the internet, right? You know, you're, uh, is there a point where that's overkill? Well, maybe. But that's kind of the society we're in now, where technology is ubiquitous, and we just like to be surrounded by it all the time. And you know, who's to say that our shirt shouldn't tell us when it's uh, time to be washed or something like that? Or, you know, you know who knows? I mean, we're going to get to that point. Maybe it washes itself. Little microbots come and take it. What else? Cars. Cars. Yeah, certainly. For a long time, for a long time, cars have had computers in them, right? You know, uh, they, they've had like little subsystems in them for doing different things. And now cars are becoming more obvious, more obvious types of uh, computers where they're now they're starting to drive themselves and things like that. So, uh, you know, we have this perception that there's certainly quite a bit more technology that's going in these vehicles than just a gas burning engine that's making you go down the road fast. All right, so we could certainly sit here for a while and come up with even more things. So a lot of stuff that's around us would fall into the category of being a computer. So typically when we think about computers, the first thing that pops into our mind is the, is the idea of general purpose computers, right? Okay. But we want to have an appreciation that pretty much everything around us uh, is a computer. All right, so kind of along those lines, type of computer systems, you know, PCs, what's the difference between a PC and a server? Well, could this guy be used as a server? Yeah, yeah we can certainly could set it up as a server. Um, what priorities change? When you have, a, when you have a, just a personal computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, it's a laptop or a desktop, uh, a personal computer, it needs to be really good at what? Who is it trying to make happy? One person, right? One person. So at the very least, even if the hardware is very similar, it's tuned to making one person happy, right? Now, a server might be very, very, very similar to a PC in terms of hardware and things like that. In fact, you know, in a pinch, you could probably make a relatively low-powered PC act as a you know, low end server if you had to. But a server, generally speaking, is trying to solve what problem? Make a whole bunch of people happy at the same time. Right? So one might say, so this is make a bunch of people happy at the same time. So now we might say that uh, um, in order to pull that off, for as the number of people go up, okay, as we go to five, 10, you know, 100, 1,000, a million people, as that goes up, the resources that we want, that we need to have in those computers needs to also increase, right? So we kind of go back to this, this what is a computer? Could we say that a computer is a collection of resources? Actually, I'm gonna start a new slide for this, otherwise the font's gonna get, uh, too small. Just kick it here. 
call it computing resources. All right, so as our, uh, uh, the number of users who will be simultaneously stressing the server goes up, there are computing resources would also need to increase. What are, the, what are the computing resources that we're talking about? What falls into the category of a computing resource? Processors. Processors. All right, so we, got, we have CPUs. All right, that's one of our computing resources. So more people, we need more CPUs and more powerful CPUs and blah, 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 blah. Okay, we'll talk about those uh, individually. What else? Memory. Memory. So we need more RAM, faster RAM, blah, 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 blah. What else? Uh, possibly GPUs. In fact, um, GPUs are becoming even more important to performance today. Why, why is that? So you mentioned GPUs. Historically, so when you're talking about GPUs, you're talking about graphics cards. Mm -hmm. Historically, graphics cards were uh, really only important for gamers, right? Let's just say. Why is it more than that now? Why might um, some powerful GPUs be important for server computing now? Okay, so they certainly are. They certainly are used for rendering. So if you have a server that's doing some um, uh, uh, some rendering stuff, uh, having a lot of GPUs might be ha handy. What else? Why are they good at rendering? Maybe that's the, the better next question. What's the difference between a GPU and a CPU? Here, let's just pause this for a second. Let's give some definition here. What's a CPU? You see, I always get that same first answer. A oh, central processing unit. I think the rest of it's self-explanatory. Isn't it the thing that controls all the hardware? Uh, it's certainly an integral part. Yeah, without the CPU, things aren't going to happen. Um, I'm not sure about the uh, controlling everything else. It might, we, and we might be starting to talk about a chicken or the egg type problem. Um, so Van kind of already knows my canned answer. Let's see if somebody else can, can throw something out here. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so let me kind of ask it, uh, well, let's, let's go this route. So we're going to do an interactive activity, right? Everybody ready to feel ridiculous? Okay, put, put your, put your hand up. All right. So now, now, now bend your thumb like this. All right. We got, everybody got that? We got that one? We got that move? Yeah. All right. How many of you were impressed that I could do that? All of you could do it too, right? None of you are impressed. Okay. Now. Now bend your finger like this. All of you can do that too? So that's not that impressive. How about make a fist? Now, are any of those individual things that important? None of you are, none of you are impressed that I can make a fist, or I can move my thumb around, or I can move my finger around. So what do I need to do that for? What's the purpose of those things? Did God just throw us down here and say, this is going to be funny? <laughs> you know, I, we just did three little things. We could certainly come up with all sorts. We could wiggle our toes, right? We could turn our head back and forth. We could do all sorts of stuff, right? Why? What's the point of that? Do you ever use this? Do you ever use that move? <laughs> You use it all the time. How many of you opened a car door today? How many of you, how many of you uh, grabbed a, 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 a cup of water or something like that? Don't you use that move all the time without even thinking about it? So the move in and of itself, not really important, not really impressive. You just, you just sat there in like the doctor's office just, uh, you know, just like, like shocked. Oh my gosh, look what I can do. They're pretty sure which doctor you're seeing. All right, so uh, nobody's impressed by that. Human beings have a gigantic set of things that we can do, right? Now, where things get really impressive is when we 
link a bunch of those things together and actually do something amazing, right? Now, we already decided that one of the amazing things we did today was open a car door, right? But none of us are really amazed by that either. But we can maybe think that that's still way more special than this, right? But now you start watching professional sports or you watch the Olympics or something like that. And you see people doing things that the common person can't do, right? And they're doing it with the exact same basic abilities that each one of us has. All of a sudden that starts becoming special, right? They're, they're the more expensive hardware. Right? They, they can do things that's beyond the, the normal. They've learned how to take the primitive types that have been given to them and turn it into really cool solutions to problems. I like to think of CPUs as a collection of magic tricks, similar to how we're kind of a collection of, you know, little stupid things, collection of magic tricks, things that we can do that in and of themselves feel kind of meaningless, right? But when you link them together, when you do enough things in the right order, something miraculous can happen. All right, so CPU is a collection of magic tricks. Each magic trick performs some, I'll just put it in quotes, small action that may not be impressive within itself. But when performed in conjunction with other actions, some real problem is solved. Make sense? So then we have to ask the, uh, the question, okay, so um, who decides what magic tricks are required for a CPU? Who makes CPUs? <clears throat> what are some companies that make CPUs? Intel? Intel? So Intel makes CPUs. What kind of CPUs does Intel make? Okay, so they make, Intel makes general purpose CPUs, right? So they had to kind of imagine a collection of magic tricks. They had to decide, what are the collection of magic tricks that I need to, that I need to build into the CPU so that this guy can perform any sort of problem, can solve any sort of problem that a computer should be able to solve? Now, it might not do it in the most efficient way. That's kind of where the evolution of these chips comes from. But they have to kind of settle on the, the instruction set, the list of magic tricks that the CPU has through which all things you solve on that computer must be done in terms of. All right? As we go through our daily lives and we open car doors, grab tennis rackets, whatever, we have to do everything in terms of our capabilities. Right? You know, we don't have the ability to uh, uh, use eight arms when we only have two. Right? We don't get that. We, so we have, to, we have to solve problems in terms of what we're bringing to the table. CPUs work the same way. So we have to consider what are the types, what is the classification of problems that, are, that we're going to solve using a computer? And then what is the set of magic tricks that are granular enough that they can be applied to multiple problems? Like, you know, like we can, that little thumb movement here, you know, that seems kind of stupid in and of itself, but we probably can apply that to lots of different problems. That's a helpful little movement, right? A very similar thing is going to happen at the CPU level. So we need these granular enough magic tricks that they can be applied to lots of problems, yet they're powerful enough that we're not, uh, you know, doing things in slow motion, you know? So, you know, we've kind of advertised this magic trick where I can, you know, the whole thumb is moving. Well, what if that's magic trick one? That's magic trick two. That's magic trick three. That's magic trick four. That's magic trick five. That's magic trick six. That's starting to get a little ridiculous, right? Even though we kind of can control where we stop in the middle there, the, the, this movement of the thumb across that, uh, uh, that axis is helpful. But we don't need each individual little uh, uh, stopping point to be treated as a separate ability, right? So we have, got the, we have to kind of find that sweet spot. When you're Intel and you're making your CPUs, you have to find that sweet spot of what's enough magic tricks to let you solve problems, as opposed to what's too many, where all of a sudden not 
each in, each magic trick isn't strong enough to do very much on its own. Where all of a sudden you have to string a whole bunch of them together to do something. Now at the same time, you don't want to error the other way where you don't give enough magic tricks. You know, where all of a sudden you have to like overcompensate. You have to do, you know, some big movement and then back it off a little bit in order to accomplish what you actually want. Because the magic tricks that they gave you was kind of, uh, you know, you they were too big for the problem you want to solve. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so we're kind of looking for that sweet spot. And then over the years, as, you know, each year new processors come out, uh, we might add more magic tricks on that we decide, oh, well, so the kinds of problems people are solving today could benefit from having this additional magic trick. Or we might combine some of the existing magic tricks into a single magic trick because maybe they're used together really often. So, you know, in, so we might have three magic tricks individual, in, you know, sitting there individually. And then let's say they happen to be used together very often. They still are used separately. But maybe they happen to be used together very often. So now what you might do is they might add a fourth magic trick, which is actually these three, oh, these three all put together. So it's faster. Make sense? We'll still give you these three individual ones that you can use them to solve other things. But because these guys are used together pretty often, and because we've gotten better at shrinking stuff down on the CPUs, we got a little extra space on here. We'll go ahead and give you that combo, the combo meal here with those three magic tricks kind of all squished together. And it makes the, and they optimize it to make it super fast or something. Kind of make sense? All right, so that's what a CPU is. What is a GPU? You mentioned it's gra they're graphics cards, right? Well, what makes something a graphics card? What does a graphics card do? Is a graphics card a computer? Are you asking me or telling me? Because <laughs> I probably know the answer. I might be making it up, possibly. Now, notice the last question I asked was, is a graphics card a computer? I didn't say GPU. I said graphics card. A GPU is a part of a graphics card. We'll, we'll, we'll elaborate on that in a few minutes. But what's a graphics card? So we got this, got this thing, right? This honking thing. We shove it into the computer, and all of a sudden we can play awesome video games, or run virtual reality, or do, you know, high-end rendering stuff. Is a graphics card a computer? Probably a safe enough guess at the very least, since we've listed all this other crap that was a computer, right? If your old Motorola flip phone's a computer, certainly a graphics card probably is. So does a graphics card have memory on it? Okay, does a graphics card have a, a, a processor on it? Maybe called a GPU? Graphics processing unit? Okay, that's, that's the processor. Does it probably have some of those other resources in the middle that kind of start making it sound like a computer? Yeah, it has a, has a lot of those pieces, right? Now, when we think about an Intel processor, when we think about a PC or a server, those things are built for solving general purpose kinds of problems, right? When you go and you buy your latest, greatest laptop, you're going to use that guy for checking your email, for writing, you know, to doing word processing, to browsing the web, to listening to music, everything under the sun. Things that you can do on computers, you, you're going to rely on that guy being able to do it, right? Now, what about a graphics card? When you buy a new graphics card, you expect to be able to check your email on it? You expect to be able to word process on it, or word process on that guy? What are you expecting out of your graphics card? Go ahead. Uh, like even, uh, page that you need to pass, uh, anything computing intensive? So that's a loaded question. Yeah. Now certainly we start off. We start off with this idea of graphics and things like that, right? Things that involve images, stuff like that. We kind of, I mean, the fact that it says it has the word graphics in front of it, it says graphics card, that must be involved, right? 
What does it mean to compute graphics? So does the graphics card ultimately, is that the guy that spits the stuff out on the screen so we can see it? How much stuff does it need to spit out onto the screen at a time? We're going to talk about this in more detail later on today, but if you took a, take a monitor like that, what's each little dot of light called? Pixel. How many pixels are on that monitor? A lot. So we round it down, right? It's a lot of them. Now, each of those pixel... Each of those pixels is going to take some amount of com computation power in order to drive it, right? Okay, now, how often are those pixels changing? Often. Now, even what we're looking at right now, I mean, if we're looking at optimizing it, since we, I don't have stuff moving on the screen right now, I'm moving stuff, right? But, you know, the hope would be that the computer is smart enough not to uh, have to re redo a bunch of that. Let's say we're watching a movie. To, you know, we'll, we'll expand on this later, but if it was constantly changing, pixels are going to be, you know, we have a lot of pixels that are changing very often, correct? And we'll talk about exactly how often is very often later on. That's going to take quite a bit of you know, computing to do that. Specifically, if we were to, I'm going to kind of throw a, a piece out here. We're going to say a collection of magic tricks for solving general purpose computing problems. And then I'm going to steal that line. And we're going to come in here to our GPU one. And we're going to change general purpose here to domain specific commuting computing problems where the domain is graphics stuff. So we don't need as many magic tricks, right? We need far fewer magic tricks because to do graphics stuff, what we're ultimately doing is a lot of floating point math. That's what graphics, that's what GPUs are built to do. They do floating point math really, really, really well. Now, um, how many of you have ever purchased a graphics card? No gamers or anything in here? Oh, we have Van is in here. Okay, so um, uh, so this just adds some credence here. So let's. Uh, uh, so I know you have Nvidia cards, right? So you have a you have a, a couple of 1080 GTXs, right? Three of them. Um, but you've also seen Nvidia's Quadro cards. You know what I'm talking about? So Nvidia. has a card called the Quadro. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, versions of the Quadro, but basically every single one of their GTX cards has a Quadro equivalent. And it's the same performance in terms of, let's call it gaming performance. But it's like 10 times the price. Why? Just because it's called Quadro? Well, they even have a different same GPU. All right. They're typically almost identical in every single way. The Quadro cards, what they've done is they've taken the GPU. So GPUs have to meet some sort of threshold, any CPU. So like when you buy a, uh, a CPU that's 2.4 gigahertz, and we'll talk more about that later, um, you might be able to overclock that CPU, right? Maybe you could push it to four gigahertz or something like that. But if you have 10 G CPUs that were sold to you as being identical, you might not be able to push each of those to the same limit because not all of them are made identically. Small little manufacturing changes with the silicon and things like that might lead it. So when they stress test the GPU or stress test the CPU, they're saying it operates comfortably 
at this clock speed. Anything beyond that, you're, you're taking risk. Make sense? What they do for the quadros is they handpick the best of the best of the best. Okay? The ones that could be pushed the hardest. Now, typically, and I'm oversimplifying this a little bit, but typically the people who push your G the GPUs are people who are overclocking their graphics cards for video game stuff. Okay? Uh, or crypto mining stuff, whatever. Um, but quadro cards are very popular for um, uh, CAD drawing, where people are doing designs, engineering designs for buildings and things like that, where um, fractions of an inch make a difference. You need precision on those that floating point math. So... The quadro drivers allow the math to be done at a higher level of precision for accuracy. And you're paying a premium for those, that, those hand-picked chips that can, that can do that. That kind of makes sense? So nobody in their right mind would pay 10 times more for a quadro card than a, uh, G, a, the equivalent GTX card if they're using it for playing video, video games. They promise you at 120 frames a second, the uh, difference between one pixel and another pixel is not going to be noticed. Make sense? But after you've built the skyscraper, you're off a little bit, you might regret that. <laughs> Make sense? Okay, so uh, uh, different tools for different jobs type things. Okay, so that's more of just a trivia thing, the whole quadro stuff. Um, because that's something that comes up for a lot of people who are buying graphics cards. Like, well, why the heck is this thing so much more? If you're a CAD designer, get that one. If you're not, don't. <laughs> get, get, get more of the other one. All right, so having said that, notice I've said domain-specific computing problems for GPUs. So that means these guys are specifically designed to do floating-point math really, really, really fast. They're not designed to support checking your email and all these other things that a general purpose computer can do. All right, so let's jump back here to the CPU for a second. So what are some examples of, uh, here, let's throw another slide in here. CPU examples. What are some examples of CPUs? What are CPUs you've heard of? Okay, Core i3, i5. I7, okay. uh, I9, well, I, I bet you that doesn't stay around for very long. Yeah. Yeah, because it was, the I9 was a, uh, a, a money grab to compete with the latest octa-core from AMD. It's a stupid chip. <laughs> like it doesn't exist. Um, there's nothing wrong with the performance of it. I mean, it's a cool chip. It's a high performance chip, but for the money, it's way too expensive to stick around for any I mean it's a it's a niche market. So that was that what you got in your machine? Yeah. You got an I9? That is that's what you were telling me earlier that the 54 54 uh cores? 36 cores. Hmm. All right, well that's at least related to what we're going to talk about next. So the Core i3s, Core i5s, Core i7 and here to make him feel better we'll throw a Core i9. How much you spend on that chip? It's a expensive chip. All right, so, and then within each of these, you have different generations. So the Core i processors have been around for many years now, right? I think right now we're on the, um, uh, what, the eighth generation i7s? Uh, the, the eighth generation are the ones that are just coming out now. 7700 was the last one, the seventh generation, so the, the next one's coming out with the eighth generation. All right, so regardless, they've been out for seven, eight, nine years, whatever, something like that. Because um, they don't necessarily come out every year, but ballparky. Generally speaking, this guy, so what do you think changes with the Core i5 processor between last year and the year before that, the year before that, and the year before that? Possibly clock speed. But I bet you if you go back and you look at processors from 10 years ago, you'll see pretty similar clock speeds to what we have today. 2.8 gigahertz, 3.2 gigahertz. You have some of those turbo things, right? 
well, you know, it, it runs at 2.7 gigahertz uh, uh, with a turbo boost up to 3.8. You know, in little, so that's kind of like situational overclocking. Kind of like, you know, don't run it at this speed for very long. But if you need that horsepower, you know, kind of like when you have one of those, uh, the big cars with a V8 engine that gets horrible gas mileage. 99% you know, of the time you don't need it. That one time that you need to pull a giant boat or you need to get up to uh, a high speed getting onto the interstate instantaneously, you're going to burn through three gallons of gas, but you've got the horsepower to do it. You know, that's, that's the turbo speed, right? It typically goes <laughs> zero to 60 in you know, 11 seconds. <laughs> now it goes zero to 60 in four at the cost of burning a whole bunch of gas. All right, but clock speed really has not changed drastically in the last 10 years. So what does change? It's related to what we talked about today. Um, a little bit number of cores, but even that hasn't changed very much in the last several years. We've really had quad cores around for a while. About three years ago, you started seeing the six cores coming out from Intel, um, but you really haven't seen much much past, uh, past that. Um, in development, you have some more higher core counts than that, but uh, in general, you don't see tons and tons there. So like the combining of the tricks yeah. is more efficient? Yeah. So what you have is you have those magic tricks. You have optimizations of those magic tricks. When a new processor comes out and they say, oh, this one uh, performs a certain task at 40% um, you know, faster than last year's model, blah, blah, blah. So under most conditions, you might not notice the difference between this year's Core i7 and last year's Core i7. But if there's some very specific tasks that you do often that the this year's i7 was optimized to do, it might be a major, a major benefit for you. Now, how many of you have ever put together a computer, built one, built one yourself? All right. Um, has the sizes of the chips changed in the last several years? Yeah. If you have a motherboard from two years ago that has an Core i7, could you get the latest i7 and put it in there? Yeah. Probably within a couple of years you could. Probably within a couple of years. Generally speaking, the size of those processors hasn't changed. Um, sometimes what will change is the number of pins that come out of it, and then you do need a new motherboard. So the processor is still the same physical size, but it might look a little more toothy <laughs> on, on the bottom, so you need a different little uh, inset for it. That just has to do with kind of the, the architecture changes. But just generally speaking, just to kind of support this example here, a processor from last year versus a processor this year to the naked eye, probably doesn't look any different. What has changed? All right, potentially number of transistors. We get, we've been getting better and better at squeezing more stuff into the same space, right? The enemy is kind of heat, right? You get a lot of heat involved and things go bad. Then you have, you know, the, the diff distance between the wires at the, like, you know, the, the microscopic level where they start interfering with each other. If they get one micron closer, you know, when new chips come out, they'll call them like, what, 13 nanometer chips, 11 nanometer chips. That's the, that's how close they can get those wires, wires at the uh, kind of, you know, the, the microscopic level before it, 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 it starts causing, you know, instability. Make sense? So each year, let's say, we get a little bit better at that. Now, for a long time, we kept, we're making these huge strides, right? So uh, one of the things the book talks about is the uh, you know the how for a long time you know computers were were doubling in speed every 15 seconds you know that kind of, that kind of stuff. Well, we don't really have that now. Ours is more situational um, uh, uh, type things, but we still are getting better. We keep improving things. We're just not improving at the um, at the speed we were improving before in terms of single core performance. So what have we started doing? We started putting more cores in. But is more cores always better? So if we look at this, this is usually a, a Core i3 is usually a two core processor. Core i4, uh, Core i5 rather, comes in a two or a four configuration. The Core i5s that are two core are typically in laptops. Pretty much, uh, I think, 
I think now every i5 desktop processor is a quad core. Um, I7s are four or six core. Um, I think the i is the i9 only 32 cores. Eight, 12, 36. And you've got the 36 core one? Oh, so you'll be our little guinea pig here. All right, so um, why the 36 one? Just because, I mean, well, first of all, it does sound cool. Right? Like, look, I got a 36 core i9. So expensive. Okay. I don't care what's in your computer, mine's better. <laughs> <laughs> so the question then is, is, is more cores better? What does more cores get you? Um, process in parallel. Okay, so it does does uh, so four cores means we can do four things at once. How many things can a single core processor? We don't have them anymore, but uh, well, we do have some smaller chips that are single single core, but our general purpose ones are not. But how many things can a single core processor do at a time at one time? One thing. It might be able to do it really fast. So it might do one thing, then another thing, then another thing. And we might think all three of those things happened at the same time because it happened so quickly. But it only did one thing at a time. Right? So a dual core can do two things at once. A quad core can do four things at once. Is more cores better? Then less cores? Let's, let's give an example. So let's say uh, we're uh, uh, right near the end of fall. So before, before a winter, uh, winter break, all the leaves were falling down, right? right? And uh, let's say we, we volunteer to, to rake the leaves on campus. Okay, I'm going to take the west side of campus. And all of you are going to take the... Uh, uh, the, the east side of campus. Okay, now for this example, we're going to assume that I'm a really, really, really fast <laughs> leaf raker. Okay, I, I rake leaves at speed 10. Now, each of you rake leaves at speed 7. You're 30% slower than me. Who's going to rake their half of the campus faster? Uh, you guys, why? Can you guys divide up the east side of campus up into five pieces? So even though each of you are individually raking slower than I can, each of you are only doing a fifth of the work, right? So you're going to be done way ahead of me. Make sense? Go ahead. Can two cores work on the same task? Potentially, as long as they're, they're as long as there's not they're not reliant on each other. So we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. But uh, but now so let's so so in that case in that case the uh, the, the the six core processor here was 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 good, right? And the single core processor, even though it was really fast, was was less good. Okay, so now we're going to change this uh, changes up a little bit. All right, um, one of these light bulbs went out. One of them, and again. I just happen to be really fast at changing light bulbs. I can change a light bulb at speed 10. Now each of you has a very similar light bulb changing skill to your raking skill. So each of you can change a light bulb at speed seven. So we have one light bulb out over here. We have one light bulb out over there. I'm gonna change this one. You guys are gonna change that one. Who's gonna get their light bulb changed quicker? <laughs> Me, why? You can't divide that up. You know, it's the old joke. How many people does it take to change a light bulb? Right? So that exact same war, you guys won the leaf raking easily by a lot. But I won the light bulb changing because the tasks we were doing had were, were a different nature, right? One was easily divisible into, you know, into pieces. The other one was not. So who would win? Me at speed 10 or Van's 36 core i9 at speed 9? I still win. 
I still win. Because you've got this one slow guy up there with 35 of his buddies looking up at him. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, then why don't they put in like two gears, like one really fast chip, so like if it's a single pass chip, that will attack that, but then multiple chips, or multiple cores, I guess, for the other processor. It's an excellent question. Uh, you an iPhone user or an Android user? Was Android, no, my. Okay, so you got a 10 or you got an 8? Eight? 8. eight. Um, so actually, your, your, yours is a, it's a very a good question related to what you uh, have. Uh, well, it's probably not yours. Sitting on the desk there, not in the pocket. You have a quad core processor in your. Um, in fact, actually, what's in your phone is the fastest mobile processor on the market today. Faster than any Android processor. Um, yours is only quad core. A lot of Android phones are octa core, have eight cores. Historically, iPhones have been very good at single core performance and not as good at multi core performance because less cores, right? You know, like uh, I, have, I was an iPhone user until this last year. I wasn't going to wait two extra months for the iPhone 10, so I switched to Android. But we have an, my wife has an 8, and I write software for both of them. Um, but I have eight processors in my Note 8. Great. So I can do eight things at once, technically. How often do I need to do eight things at once? Probably not very often, but I could probably pull off two things at once at a pretty good clip. The Bionic chip that's in the uh, new uh, iPhone, the iPhone 8, uh, <laughs> is an impressive chip. And that's the same processor that's in the 10, first of all. Um, that's the best value phone that's on the market right now. I mean, the 10 is cool enough for five minutes, but um, for what you paid for that compared to what's in it, that has everything that's in the 10, minus the stupid face recognition thing, uh, which might be a big deal moving forward. I just don't think we're where we need to be with it right now. Everybody I've talked to says that um, the face recognition is actually really good with it. They're like, they're shocked how good it is. I just don't think we're ready. I don't think we're ready to just use that all the time at this point. Um, you know, as a guy who, you know, goes through the interface of a Vietnamese guy was? Yes. So what are you saying? They all look the same? No, so it's not. They all look the same. But, you know, they, <laughs> they just take a picture and make the 3D version of the face. No, I get it. The, the I, I mean, I've seen, like, I, I saw some videos where they couldn't, uh, like, identical twins were able to trick it and stuff like that. But at the very least, Apple's face recognition stuff is, is well beyond all the other competitors right now. I just don't think we're where we need to be with that for it to be useful. Um, but regardless, so kind of back to your, your question, that particular processor, and Apple's done this for a little bit, um, but your processor is quad core. Two of them are high performance cores. The other two are lower power, lower performance cores. So that means most of the time it's going to try to use the low power cores because you get better battery life. The rest of the time it's going to use the two powerful cores. It'll burn through your battery, but you're fast. But now what's interesting in this particular processor is historically, let's just use the Samsung Note 8 versus iPhone, the 8-core processor in a, a Note 8 historically would handily beat the, well, let's say the Note 7, would handily beat the iPhone 7's multiprocessor uh, uh, benchmarks. But the iPhone would almost always win single-core. Because iPhones, they're 64-bit processor, they're, and they make their own silicon Well, actually they they bought the company that makes silicon in it or whatever. Um, they're just very good at single core performance. The bionic chip that's in that now has caught up and surpassed. iPhone's processor actually kills any uh, ARM processor that's on uh, the Android side, by on both sides. It's even faster comparatively on single core, and it's almost twice as fast multiple core. It's a really amazing chip. If Apple spent most of their marketing dollars talking about the technology that's in that processor, it would have sold. You know, instead, people viewed it as like, oh, well, it's basically just an iPhone 7. And for the mo for practical uses, it is. My wife has an 8. She had a 7. She doesn't notice any difference. But if you were trying to run something on there that was going to push it, you got a pretty good engine in that thing. So, but, but the point is we've been doing things like that for, for a while, you know, trying to uh, not make sure that not every core is necessarily created equally. Um, certainly in the mobile um, 
market, less in desktop stuff. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that they um, thought it was better to put uh, two higher performance cores and two lower performance cores in your phone? Um, maybe, uh, maybe, and that kind of goes uh, back to kind of the old multitasking argument. I'm sure at some point we'll we'll get, and maybe we'll even get into it today. Um, but uh, well, heck, let's just talk about it now. It's it's interesting enough, but because um, it's related to what we're talking about right here. So when you said it used to be Android, right? You used to use Android for how many years? Um, two years. Okay, so have you flip flop back and forth, or are you just not a smartphone Sorry, user? Four years. I did have an iPhone, and then went to Android. Okay. In the early days of Android, they would brag about how their um, uh, they had multitasking, and Apple did not. Mm -hmm. Right? Kind of remember those commercials? Um, now, you would see that all over the place on their commercials, right? Android had multitasking, Apple did not. Uh, what did, what was the problem with Android back then? What would everybody complain about with Android when they said that they had uh, multitasking? Hmm. Battery life. Battery life was abysmal. Beyond abysmal. What was the most popular app on the Android app store the first year the uh, app store was live for Android? You don't have to know the name of it. What did the app do? It killed other apps that were running on your app, on your phone. The most popular apps were apps that allowed you to conveniently kill apps that you didn't realize were running, that were just draining your battery in the background. Why is that? So iOS was out first, right? Came out before before Android. Um, and always, no, nobody's really complained that Apple's ever had bad battery life. They may have said that they wanted better battery life, but Apple's never been the uh, butt of the bad battery life joke when it came to uh, the iPhones. Uh, Android was solidly in that, <laughs> in that category for a long time. Uh, now, Android kind of rushed to, to market to kind of catch up with, with uh, Apple when iOS came out. Um, do you think Android had a bad multitasking model? I mean, the battery life was terrible. Did it suck? Did they do it wrong? What's Android based on? What operating system is the Android operating system based on? Linux. Does Linux have a good multitasking model? Well, we would hope so. What systems run Linux? What kind of systems run Linux? Some. Servers, some desktop computers. Are all those systems plugged into a wall? Yeah, so you would, uh, would is it a fair enough assumption to say that when uh, Linux implemented their multitasking model, uh, they weren't paying much attention to uh, power consumption? We're plugged into the wall, who cares? Now we're plugged into a battery. We care. So... Google is bragging about how they have multitasking, not talking about how their battery life is so horrible when those two are very related to each other. Similarly, you mentioned some speed problems. The battery life was a worse issue than the speed issue, but you had a speed problem as well because you had all these apps running in the background and they were getting CPU time, taking up your system resources. So the most popular app on Android early on was apps to close running apps you didn't know were running. And Apple didn't support multitasking at first. And even when Apple finally came out with multitasking for iOS, it wasn't what we would call traditional multitasking. An app could choose to hook into, I think it's like eight different like subsystems of the operating system. Things that Apple decided, these are things you might want to do in the background. For example, play music. You might want to have music playing in the background. So an app could decide to register with that particular subsystem. So as the app was going into the background, it could then connect and kind of keep itself partially alive, just operating off of that, that functionality. That makes sense? So paying attention to 
um, you know, battery life. And that's because Apple built iOS with mobile in mind. It's not that Apple's some sort of crazy genius. It's more of a timing and, I mean, Apple does things well, but so does Google. So does Microsoft. I mean, most of, so often Microsoft is the, you know, the, the enemy and all these jokes and stuff. I mean, some of the smartest people in the world work for Microsoft. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just all who came out with the good stuff recently. Right? That's the, uh, and they're all cherry picking each other's uh, stuff. So, uh, yeah, the multitasking model uh, for Android um, was not a mobile multitasking model. It was a desktop multitasking model. Another thing you saw in some of those early commercials with Android is um, uh, remember how they would brag how you uh, had uh, Android supported Flash? You know, web pages that had Flash on it and iOS didn't. So were you, a, were you an Android user? Um, how many of you are Android users today? Android users today. All right, so um, do you like the fact that your phone supports Flash? You know what Flash is, right? Hey, what, so does that benefit you? Sometimes it benefits you? All right, well, she fell into my trap. He didn't commit. Android has not supported Flash in probably six years. Remember in the early days when they were saying, um, Android would say, hey, we have Flash, and you know the iOS doesn't. Apple said, no, we're absolutely not going to support Flash. Instead, you know, we support HTML5. Remember that? And everybody was saying, oh, well, HTML5, that's not going to go anywhere, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is today's standard HTML5? Uh, Google dropped Flash years ago. Your phone has not supported Flash in years. In years. Android, <laughs> Android has not had Flash in years. And there's a good reason for it. They never told you that. They just stopped bragging about having it. <laughs> it is what they did. Um, but HTML5 became the standard. Um, and it took a big fish like Apple to, to make that change. Right? Um, so fair enough. So Apple won that little war. And Google stopped bragging about having Flash and just kind of quietly removed it from the operating system. Now, does that mean Flash is a bad technology? No, Flash is just an old technology. There's nothing wrong with Flash. Um, it just kind of ran its course, right? Um, but specifically, the mobile version of Flash was not very good. So even when Android supported Flash, the user experience was not like anything reasonable. Like you would probably give it a user experience of like a three out of ten. It was barely worth it if it was worth it at all. But what made it worse is we already have this issue of uh, uh, Android having bad battery life. The mobile version of Flash was absolutely terrible for battery life. Now, the best way to have seen that, and you can actually probably still see it today, because Flash still exists on desktop, right? Except now it doesn't come shipping with the browser, so you have to install it uh, afterwards. I haven't actually tested in this laptop, but I could make a pretty good guess of what would happen. So just kind of trust me on the numbers. They're not, they're going to be at least similar to this. So this laptop, if I just running it, doing, using it for normal tasks, let's say, and I'm running it off the battery, uh, I probably get, I don't know, let's call it six hours of battery life, something like that. And this is Apple's, you know, flagship MacBook Pro, 15 inch, blah, blah, blah. How much battery life do you think I would get if I was on a web page that had uh, uh, flash stuff going on it? You think five? Four? Three? Bet you I'd get less than an hour of battery life. Just uses a lot of system resources. So mobile, I mean, if flash is a bad idea for a laptop with a big old battery, I mean, most of what you, most of where the keyboard is here is battery. I mean, that's Apple's magic, right? They get these really thin laptops and they basically squeeze batteries into every little nook and cranny. That's what they're good at, right? They put batteries everywhere and then they seal the whole thing shut because, because it's not safe for you to open it. You might not be able to get it closed. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, in any case, uh, if it's not good for a laptop with a giant battery, how good could it be for a smartphone with a little battery? Not good. Right? So they got rid of that stuff, too. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, this whole idea of multitasking, and this kind of rips, goes back to kind of where we were going uh, uh, with the discussion before. More cores isn't necessarily better, right? So having more cores benefits you the most when you have a job that could be divided up into multiple tasks. Make sense? Um, where if you have a job that only changing the light bulb, you want one really fast core. Okay. So now having said that, what um, there is one task in here that most uh, you know college age technology uh, uh, people might really be envious of uh, Van for with his thirty six core setup back there. There's one task that your machine is uniquely going to be really, really, really good at. You know what that is? How can you maximize your machine? I'm sure none of you have ever downloaded a movie off the internet. Okay, it's just not something that uh, people who go to a Christian school do, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, when um, <laughs> when you download that movie, so let's say you have a you know a, a, a three gigabyte three gigabyte movie you downloaded. And you know you really want to stream it on you know device X Y Z. Maybe you want to uh, stream it on your uh, your um, Apple TV, and it just happens to be in the wrong format. You needed an MP4. You download it as an AVI, so you need to convert it. Now, if I try to convert that on a pedestrian laptop, something like that, probably take maybe an hour and a half, hour, something like that. This is a pretty good laptop, so maybe let's say an hour on this laptop. How long do you think it would take on a van setup? <laughs> it would definitely take less than an hour. I bet you it might take less than a minute. Yeah, you could you could convert media fast <laughs> because that's something that you can divide it up infinitely. You can do thirty six. You can divide the time by thirty six. And then some. It scales even bigger than that with uh, converting media. So, um, yeah, you, you're going to be pretty good at that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. I want to take a break here in a minute. just want to make sure I'm at a reasonable stopping point. So that's CPU stuff. Multi-cores isn't always better. All right, so let's take, um, what do you think, like maybe 30 seconds? <laughs> You want, you want more than 30 seconds? Uh, let's do 10 minutes. Uh, I'll give it 13 minutes. So come back at uh, 1. Uh, well, actually, what, I, what time is it? <laughs> so, hold on. Look at my timer. You come back at 1.20 on the time. <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, let's come back at 7.30. 16 minutes. Sound good? And we'll start talking about the GPU stuff some more.